Caranus, clad in a dressing gown of the sort favored by London tailors in his youth, rose eagerly to meet his guest, for the sight of an Anglo-Saxon from the waking world was very dear to him, even if it was a Saxon from Boston, Massachusetts, instead of from Cornwall. And for long they talked of old times, having much to say because both were old dreamers and well-versed in the wonders of incredible places. Caranus indeed had been out beyond the stars in the ultimate void, and was said to be the only one who had ever returned sane from such a voyage. At length Carter brought up the subject of his quest, and asked of his host those questions he had asked of so many others. Caranus did not know where Kadath was, or the marvelous Sunset City, but he did know that the Great Ones were very dangerous creatures to seek out, and that the other gods had strange ways of protecting them from impertinent curiosity. He had learned much of the other gods in distant parts of space, especially in that region where form does not exist, and colored gases study the innermost secrets. The violet gas, Snagak, had told him terrible things of the crawling chaos Nyarlhotep, and had warned him never to approach the central void where the demon sultan Azatoth gnaws hungrily in the dark. Altogether, it was not well to meddle with the Elder Ones, and if they persistently denied all access to the marvelous sunset city, it was better not to seek that city. Karanus furthermore doubted whether his guest would profit aught by coming to the city even were he to gain it. He himself had dreamed and yearned long years for lovely Selephaeus and the land of Uthnargai, and for the freedom and color and high experience of life devoid of its chains, conventions, and stupidities. But now that he was come into that city and that land, and was the king thereof, he found the freedom and the vividness all too soon worn out, and monotonous for want of linkage with anything firm in his feelings and memories. He was a king in Uthnargai, but found no meaning therein, and drooped always for the old familiar things of England that had shaped his youth. All his kingdom would he give for the sound of Cornish church bells over the downs, and all the thousand minarets of Selephaeus for the steep homely roofs of the village near his home. So he told his guest that the unknown sunset city might not hold quite the content he sought, and that perhaps it had better remain a glorious and half-remembered dream. For he had visited Carter often in the old waking days, and knew well the lovely New England slopes that had given him birth. At the last, he was very certain the seeker would long only for the early remembered scenes, the glow of Beacon Hill at evening, the tall steeples and winding hill streets of quaint Kingsport, the hoary gambrel roofs of ancient and witch-haunted Arkham, and the blessed miles of meadows and valleys where stone walls rambled and white farmhouse gables peeped out from bowers of verdure. These things, he told Randolph Carter, but still the seeker held to his purpose, and in the end they parted each with his own conviction and Carter went back through the bronze gate into Selephaeus and down the street of the pillars to the old sea wall, where he talked more with the mariners of far ports and waited for the dark ship from cold and twilight Inginoch, whose strange-faced sailors and onyx traders had in them the blood of the great ones. One starlight evening, when the pharos shone splendid over the harbor, the longed-for ship put in, and strange-faced sailors and traders appeared one by one and group by group in the ancient taverns along the seawall. It was very exciting to see again those living faces, so like the godlike features on Negronic, but Carter did not hasten to speak with the silent seamen. He did not know how much of pride and secrecy and dim supernal memory might fill those children of the Great Ones, and was sure it would not be wise to tell them of his quest or ask too closely of that cold desert stretching north of their twilight land. They talked little with the other folk in those ancient sea taverns, but would gather in groups in remote corners and sing among themselves the haunting airs of unknown places, or chant long tales to one another in accents alien to the rest of dreamland. 
and so rare and moving were those airs and tales that one might guess their wonders from the faces of those who listened, even though the words came to common ears only as strange cadence and obscure melody. For a week the strange seamen lingered in the taverns and traded in the bazaars of Salafaeus, and before they sailed Carter had taken passage on their dark ship, telling them that he was an old onyx miner and wishful to work in their quarries. That ship was very lovely and cunningly wrought, being of teakwood with ebony fittings and traceries of gold, and the cabin in which the traveller lodged had hangings of silk and velvet. One morning, at the turn of the tide, the sails were raised and the anchor lifted, and as Carter stood on the high stern, he saw the sunrise blazing walls and bronze statues and golden minarets of ageless Celepheus sink into the distance and the snowy peak of Mount Aaron grew smaller and smaller. By noon there was nothing in sight save the gentle blue of the Serenarian Sea, with one painted galley afar off bound for that cloud-hung realm of Seranian where the sea meets the sky. And night came with gorgeous stars, and the dark ship steered for Charles Wayne and the little bear as they swung slowly round the pole, and the sailors sang strange songs of unknown places, and then stole off one by one to the forecastle, while the wistful watchers murmured old chants and leaned over the rail to glimpse the luminous fish plying in bowers beneath the sea. Carter went to sleep at midnight and rose in the glow of a young morning, marking that the sun seemed farther south than was its wont, and all through that second day he made progress in knowing the men of the ship, getting them little by little to talk of their cold twilight land of their exquisite onyx city, and of their fear of the high and impassable peaks beyond which Lang was said to be. They told him how sorry they were that no cats would stay in the land of Ingenach, and how they thought the hidden nearness of Lang was to blame for it. Only of the stony desert to the north they would not talk. There was something disquieting about that desert, and it was thought expedient not to admit its existence. On later days they talked of the quarries in which Carter said he was going to work. There were many of them, for all the city of Ingenach was builded of onyx, whilst great polished blocks of it were traded in Rinar, Agrathon, and Celepheus, and at home with the merchants of Thra, Ilarnek, and Cadatheron, for the beautiful wares of those fabulous ports. And far to the north, almost in that cold desert whose existence the men of Ingenach did not care to admit, there was an unused quarry greater than all the rest, from which had been hewn in forgotten times such prodigious lumps and blocks that the sight of their chiseled vacancies struck terror to all who beheld. Who had mined those incredible blocks, and whither they had been transported, no man might say, but it was thought best not to trouble that quarry, around which such inhuman memories might conceivably cling. So it was left all alone in the twilight, with only the raven and the rumored Shantak bird to brood over its immensities. When Carter heard of this quarry, he was moved to deep thought, for he knew from old tales that the Great One's castle atop unknown Kadath is of onyx. Each day the sun wheeled lower and lower in the sky, and the mists overhead grew thicker and thicker, and in two weeks there was not any sunlight at all, but only a weird gray twilight shining through a dome of eternal cloud by day, and a cold, starless phosphorescence from the underside of that cloud by night. On the twentieth day a great jagged rock in the sea was sighted from afar, the first land glimpsed since Arryn's snowy peak had dwindled behind the ship. Carter asked the captain the name of that rock, but was told it had no name, and had never been sought by any vessel because of the sounds that came from it at night. And when, after dark, a dull and ceaseless howling arose from that jagged granite place, the traveler was glad that no stop had been made, and that the rock had no name. The seamen prayed and chanted till the noise was out of earshot, and Carter dreamed terrible dreams within dreams in the small hours. Two mornings after that, there loomed far ahead and to the east a line of great gray peaks whose tops were lost in the changeless clouds of that twilight world. 
and at the sight of them the sailors sang glad songs, and some knelt down on the deck to pray, so that Carter knew they were coming to the land of Inginok, and would soon be moored to the basalt keys of the great town bearing that land's name. Toward noon a dark coastline appeared, and before three o'clock there stood out against the north the bulbous domes and fantastic spires of the onyx city. Rare and curious did that archaic city rise above its walls and keys, all of delicate black with scrolls, flutings, and arabesques of inlaid gold. Tall and many-windowed were the houses, and carved on every side with flowers and patterns whose dark symmetries dazzled the eye with a beauty more poignant than light. Some ended in swelling domes that tapered to a point, others in terraced pyramids whereon rose clustered minarets displaying every phase of strangeness and imagination. The walls were low and pierced by frequent gates, each under a great arch rising high above the general level and capped by the head of a god chiseled with that same skill displayed in the monstrous face on distant Negronic. On a hill in the center rose a sixteen-angled tower, greater than all the rest, and bearing a high-pinnacled belfry resting on a flattened dome. This, the seaman said, was the temple of the Elder Ones, and was ruled by an old high priest, sad with inner secrets. At intervals, the clang of a strange bell shivered over the onyx city, answered each time by a peal of mystic music made up of horns, veals, and chanting voices, and from a row of tripods on a gallery round the high dome of the temple there burst flares of flame at certain moments, for the priests and people of that city were wise in the primal mysteries, and faithful in keeping the rhythms of the great ones as set forth in scrolls older than the Panarchotic manuscripts. As the ship rode past the great basalt breakwater into the harbor, the lesser noises of the city grew manifest, and Carter saw the slaves, sailors, and merchants on the docks. The sailors and merchants were of the strange-faced race of the gods, but the slaves were squat, slant-eyed folk, said by rumor to have drifted somehow across or around the impassable peaks from the valleys beyond Lang. The wharves reached wide outside the city wall, and bore upon them all manner of merchandise from the galleys anchored there, while at one end were great piles of onyx, both carved and uncarved, awaiting shipment to the far markets of Rinar, Agrathon, and Selephaeus. It was not yet evening when the dark ship anchored beside a jutting key of stone, and all the sailors and traders filed the shore and through the arched gate into the city. The streets of that city were paved with onyx, and some of them were wide and straight, whilst others were crooked and narrow. The houses near the water were lower than the rest, and bore above their curiously arched doorways certain signs of gold, said to be in honor of the respective small gods that favored each. The captain of the ship took Carter to an old sea tavern where flocked the mariners of quaint countries, and promised that he would the next day show him the wonders of the twilight city, and lead him to the taverns of the onyx miners by the northern wall. And evening fell, and little bronze lamps were lighted, and the sailors in that tavern sang songs of remote places. But when, from its high tower, the great bell shivered over the city, and the peal of the horns and veals and voices rose cryptical in answer thereto, all ceased their songs or tales, and bowed silent till the last echo died away. For there is a wonder and a strangeness on the twilight city of Inganok, and men fear to be lax in its rites, lest a doom and a vengeance lurk unsuspectedly close. Far in the shadows of that tavern, Carter saw a squat form he did not like, for it was unmistakably that of an old, slant-eyed merchant he had seen so long before in the taverns of Dilth Lean, who was reputed to trade with the horrible stone villages of Lang, which no healthy folk visit, and whose evil fires are seen at night from afar, and even to have dealt with the high priest not to be described, which wears a yellow silken mask over its face, and dwells all alone in the prehistoric stone monastery. This man had seemed to show a queer gleam of knowing when Carter asked the traders of Dilith Lean about the cold waste and Kadath, and somehow his presence in dark and haunted Inganok, 
so close to the wonders of the north, was not a reassuring thing. He slipped wholly out of sight before Carter could speak to him, and sailors later said that he had come with a yak caravan from some point not well determined, bearing the colossal and rich-flavored eggs of the rumored Shantak bird to trade for the dexterous jade goblets that merchants brought from Illernek. On the following morning, the ship captain led Carter through the onyx streets of Ingenok, dark under their twilight sky, the inlaid doors and figured house fronts, carven balconies and crystal-paned orioles, all gleamed with a somber and polished loveliness, and now and then a plaza would open out with black pillars, colonnades, and the statues of curious beings, both human and fabulous. Some of the vistas down long and unbending streets, or through side alleys and over bulbous domes, spires, and arabesqued roofs, were weird and beautiful beyond words and nothing was more splendid than the massive height of the great central temple of the Elder Ones, with its sixteen carven sides, its flattened dome, and its lofty pinnacled belfry, overtopping all else, and majestic whatever its foreground. And always to the east, far beyond the city walls and the leagues of pasture land, rose the gaunt gray sides of those topless and impassable peaks across which hideous Lang was said to lie. The captain took Carter to the mighty temple, which is set with its walled garden in a great round plaza, whence the streets go as spokes from a wheel's hub. The seven arched gates of that garden, each having over it a carven face like those on the city gates, are always open, and the people roam reverently at will down the tiled paths, and through the little lanes lined with grotesque termini and the shrines of modest gods. And there are fountains, pools, and basins, there to reflect the frequent blaze of the tripods on the high balcony, all of onyx, and having in them some luminous fish taken by divers from the lower bowers of ocean. When the deep clang from the temple's belfry shivers over the garden and the city, and the answer of the horns and veals and voices peals out from the seven lodges by the garden gates, there issue from the seven doors of the temple long columns of masked and hooded priests in black, bearing at arm's length before them great golden bowls from which a curious steam rises. And all the seven columns strut peculiarly in the single file, legs thrown far forward without bending the knees, down the walks that lead to the seven lodges, wherein they disappear and do not appear again. It is said that subterrane paths connect the lodges with the temple, and that the long files of priests return through them. Nor is it unwhispered that deep flights of onyx steps go down to mysteries that are never told. But only a few are those who hint that the priests in the masked and hooded columns are not human priests. Carter did not enter the temple, because none but the veiled king is permitted to do that. But before he left the garden, the hour of the bell came, and he heard the shivering clang deafeningly above him, and the wailing of the horns and veals and voices loud from the lodges by the gates, and down the seven great walks stalked the long files of bowl-bearing priests in their singular way, giving the traveler a fear which human priests do not often give. When the last of them had vanished, he left that garden, noting as he did so a spot on the pavement over which the bowls had passed, even the ship captain did not like that spot, and hurried him on toward the hill where on the veiled king's palace rises many domed and marvelous. The ways to the onyx palace are steep and narrow, all but that broad curving one where the king and his companions ride on yaks or in yak-drawn chariots. Carter and his guide climbed up an alley that was all steps, between inlaid walls bearing strange signs in gold, and under balconies and orioles whence sometimes floated soft strains of music or breaths of exotic fragrance. Always ahead loomed those titan walls, mighty buttresses, and clustered and bulbous domes for which the veiled king's palace is famous, and at length they passed under a great black arch and emerged in the gardens of the monarch's pleasure. There Carter paused in faintness at so much beauty, for the onyx terraces and colonnaded walks, 
the gay parterres and delicate flowering trees espaliered to golden lattices, the brazen urns and tripods with cunning bas-reliefs, the pedestaled and almost breathing statues of veiled black marble, the basalt bottom lagoons and tiled fountains with luminous fish, the tiny temples of iridescent singing birds atop carbon columns, the marvelous scrollwork of the great bronze gates, and the blossoming vines trained along every inch of the polished walls, all joined to form a site whose loveliness was beyond reality, and half fabulous even in the land of dream. There it shimmered like a vision under that gray twilight sky, with the domed and fretted magnificence of the palace ahead, and the fantastic silhouette of the distant impassable peaks on the right. And ever the small birds and the fountains sang, while the perfume of rare blossoms spread like a veil over that incredible garden. No other human presence was there, and Carter was glad it was so. Then they turned and descended again the onyx alley of steps, for the palace itself no visitor may enter, and it is not well to look too long and steadily at the great central dome, since it is said to house the archaic father of all the rumored Shantak birds, and to send out queer dreams to the curious. After that, the captain took Carter to the north quarter of the town, near the gate of the caravans, where are the taverns of the yak merchants and the onyx miners. And there, in a low-sealed inn of quarrymen, they said farewell, for business called the captain, whilst Carter was eager to talk with miners about the north. There were many men in that inn, and the traveler was not long in speaking to some of them saying that he was an old miner of onyx and anxious to know somewhat of Ingenok's quarries, but all that he learnt was not much more than he knew before, for the miners were timid and evasive about the cold desert to the north and the quarry that no man visits. They had fears of fabled emissaries from around the mountains where Lang is said to lie, and of evil presences and nameless sentinels far north among the scattered rocks, and they whispered also that the rumored Shantak birds are no wholesome things, it being indeed for the best that no man has ever truly seen one, for that fabled father of Shantaks in the king's dome is fed in the dark. The next day, saying that he wished to look over all the various mines for himself, and to visit the scattered farms and quaint onyx villages of Ingenok, Carter hired a yak and stuffed great leathern saddlebags for a journey. Beyond the gate of the caravans, the road lay straight betwixt tilled fields, with many odd farmhouses crowned by low domes. At some of these houses the seeker stopped to ask questions. Once finding a host so austere and reticent, and so full of an unplaced majesty like to that in the hung features of Negronic, that he felt certain he had come at last upon one of the great ones themselves or upon one with full nine-tenths of their blood, dwelling amongst men. And to that austere and reticent cotter he was careful to speak very well of the gods, and to praise all the blessings they had ever accorded him. 